Welcome to my start is an ultimate optimization guide. We've got tips and tweaks here to help you squeeze a little bit more for us out of your PC. Now, we have to acknowledge that most people are going to be CPU bound in this game and you can't really do much about that apart from buy a fast CPU. But these tweaks and tips should really actually give everybody some more performance. Now, I've seen some of these videos in the past where they're kind of just guessing at things that might happen. Everything you're gonna see here is actually backed up by testing that I've done and I'll show you the numbers on the screen. And so hopefully by the end of this, you will be able to get a bit more performance out of your system. Let's get into it. First up, RAM. The obvious thing to say with RAM is make sure that it's actually running at the speed you think it is. If you've updated the BIOS or maybe you've never looked at this, check in the performance tab of the task manager that your RAM is running the speed it should be. This is a big gain in performance. In the performance testing I've done before, if you've got your RAM with no profile on, it will run a lot slower than if you're running at what's advertised on the box of your RAM. If you bought a PC from a shop, just double check that your RAM is running hit the speed you want because you will lose a lot of performance if it's not. The second thing with RAM is that you can tweak your RAM. Now this takes quite a lot of effort and this is probably the trickiest thing on this whole list of things to do, but it can bring significant performance. You'll see some testing here that I did with some tuned RAM on DDR5, thanks to Captain Tombstone, thank you very much. He sent me some uh, timings basically for my RAM uh, that I could tweak and I just got a lot of performance out of it. So you can get significant boosts if you're prepared to tweak your RAM, DDR4 or DDR5, I guess even DDR3 if you want to. If you're happy to go in, do a load of research, look at some YouTube videos, you can get significant performance by tweaking and tuning your RAM. The game does prefer 32 gigs of RAM. The video I did ages ago now still holds up. The hard faults that you get when you've got 16 gigs of RAM where things are swapping in and out of system memory because it hasn't got enough the game to use still applies. And so, although this is like tips and tweaks, 32 gigs of RAM is definitely recommended over 16 if you can squeeze a bit of money to get that. Next up, let's talk about VBS or core isolation. Now, if you are prepared to turn down the security on your system, you can get a significant boost in performance. With Windows 11, by default, VBS is on, virtualization-based security. But you can turn it off for significant gains. I've tested this multiple times, and every time you get a significant boost in performance if you turn this off. It was off by default with Windows 10, but now anytime you do a fresh install of Windows 11, it will be on by default. It is worth saying though, this genuinely does reduce security of your system. So it does come with a level of risk and you really should think about whether that's something you're prepared to do. Next up, let's talk about VSync. Now, lots of people don't really understand VSync. I did a whole video on this to help people. So feel free to watch that. But the short version is that VSync reduces your frames and locks it to a certain frame rate to basically keep the screen from tearing and it gives you a locked frame rate. Now, it is a good thing in certain scenarios, but actually with a game like Star Citizen where you probably want to run free, you don't want VSync on. So make sure that either in the control panel or in the game itself, it is turned off because it will drop performance. And a lot of people will say, oh, I don't know what's going on in my system. And the obvious thing is that VSync is on and you just need to turn it off. Let's quickly talk about eCores. 12th and 13th gen Intel chips have got this hybrid system where they've got performance cores, they've got e-cores, but for Star Citizen, having the e-cores on is a bad idea. It generally causes stutters and just not good performance. You lose performance. And in theory, CIG have kind of been looking at this, but in the testing I've done in 318, it's not fixed. And 319 is basically the same code base as 318. So I imagine it's still not fixed there. So if you're having stutters and you've got one of those systems, 12th or 13th gen, Intel, try turning off the e cores in the BIOS. You, you can do other things in terms of priority and everything, but the easiest way to check is to do a BIOS, turn them off. SMT or hyperthreading. Let's talk about this quickly because in most scenarios, it's best to leave these on. It allows your CPU to have more threads and do more things. But if you've got a CPU that has got lots and lots of threads, Star Citizen won't effectively use all of them. So there are certain scenarios where it is better to turn off SMT or hyperthreading, and you'll actually see better performance because those singular cores will be able to perform better than if they are hyperthreaded or split. It's something you're going to need to test. Go into the BIOS, get some testing done. CapFrameX is the software I use for all my testing. It's very useful. 
but you're going to go and check basically how it performs with it on and with it off. But for some of you, I'm sure that that actually will bring a little bit more performance. Another window setting that is worth looking at is hardware accelerated graphics. In the testing that I've done in the past, you do find that having this on does improve performance for Star Citizen. So it's definitely worth giving a go. Again, you might need to test this one for yourself, but it's definitely worth having a look at. I've also tested motion blur and film grain settings in the game itself. And what I found is that they do have an effect on performance in game. And so for me, I've turned them off for a long time. Lots of reasons why you might want to turn them off anyway, but I do think they have an impact on Star Citizen performance. Next up, a bit of a myth. Now, lots of people will tell you when it comes to Star Citizen performance that you have to have your graphics settings on very high because that actually reduces the load on the CPU. Now, in the testing that I've done on this, I have not found that to be true, but it is not impossible that in certain scenarios that is the case. I, I just, when I tested it, couldn't replicate it. And actually, I think CRG have recently put some tweaks to actually change the graphics settings slightly so that low actually does change uh, rendering distances and things like that. So I think this one, I've called this a myth for a while. I don't think in my experience it does anything, but you might want to check out putting the graphics setting on very high if you are completely CPU bound, but I've never found it to do actually anything. Another myth would be the fact that if you use a really quick solid state drive or NVMe, you'll get more performance. And again, that is not true. I've tested this pretty extensively. Fast SSDs in RAID, it doesn't make any difference. As long as you're on an SSD, a bog standard SSD, you won't gain any more performance by getting really quick even Gen 4 or Gen 5 maybe, uh, NVMEs. The only thing that will change is the loading time in the game and it's seconds. So don't go out and buy a really fancy drive. It, it won't perform any differently from a stock, uh, just a standard SSD. And while we're talking about SSDs, let's just all remember that you cannot play this game on a hard drive. It will not run very well at all. So please make sure you're on an SSD. Another thing that may have some roots in reality, maybe not, is the NVIDIA shader cache size. Now, there was a big load of posts going around on Spectrum looking at this saying, oh, we're seeing big performance boost by increasing the size of the shader cache. Now, again, I tested this and for me, I could find no difference whatsoever. But a lot of people were saying they did find an improvement in performance by increasing the size of the shader cache. So again, this is another one to go and check out and see if it does anything for you. But in my experience, it didn't do anything. Something that CIG themselves often recommend is to clear your shaders. So here is how you do that. The easiest way is to search clear shader cache star citizen on Google, and then Reddit will show you this. You will get this type local app data slash star citizen, copy that, put that into Windows, it will come up with this and you basically then just delete the folder and that will clear it and you'll be able to start again. But when you first load up Star Citizen, it will need to recompile all the shaders. You'll be able to tell by hitting the tilde key and it will bring up the console stuff and you'll see all these compile notices, compiling, compiling, compiling. It can take roughly five minutes and so your performance will be degraded whilst that's happening. But once that's done, it will be done. Another one that may or may not do anything, resizable bar. It's worth testing this on and off. I found that when I forced it on in Star Citizen, it did increase frames very slightly, but there was all sorts of stuttering and frame time spikes. So for me, it wasn't worth forcing it on. And remember, it isn't on by default with Nvidia Cast. Only certain games are supported, but there is a way to go in and actually change it. So it's worth looking at, but and maybe more on the AMD side, it's worth looking at resizable bar to see whether it's something you want to turn on or off. This one's a bit niche, but PCIe lanes. Now, some AMD cards don't have many PCIe lanes, the GPUs, and what you'll find that they're really designed to be run on PCIe Gen 4, but if you run them on PCIe Gen 3, they lose a lot of performance. So I am sure that most of you are running in the top slot, for instance, on your on your motherboard. And I'm sure most of you are aware that you're using Gen 3 or Gen 4, but there are combinations of motherboards 
and GPUs that will not perform particularly well. So just be aware and do a bit of research into what you've got because I found when I tested the 5500 XT, it performed much worse on Gen 3 versus Gen 4. Now, the actual starters and in-game settings don't all do a lot. The clouds do a lot. <laughs> so it's worth making sure that you're not completely GPU bottlenecked by very high clouds. At higher resolutions, very high clouds are almost impossible to run, even on the top end GPUs. And so it's worth knowing on the GPU side that if you are running clouds at higher resolutions, it could be the bottleneck. You can turn them off completely and for lower end GPUs that can really help. But in general, keep an eye on the clouds. Game mode is worth having a look at in Windows. It can effectively focus all the resources or the most of the resources on the game that you're playing. And also it can turn off updates and notifications, things like that. So it is worth playing around with. I haven't found masses of performance to be gained, but I think having the updates turned off so your PC doesn't start doing some crazy update in the middle of a big gaming session is probably worth doing. And while we're talking about that, just turning off background tasks, it doesn't improve performance a lot, but having things running the background it just isn't a good idea. So minimizing what you've got going on behind the game is definitely worth doing. But in terms of things that you might think might make a difference, but don't, here's a few. HDR, in my experience, turning on auto HDR doesn't make any difference to performance, which is good. TPM, another security feature, doesn't make any difference to performance in game or in Windows. So that's fine to keep on. And then also shadow play from Nvidia. So this basically is a system that runs on your GPU, your GPU will have a separate encoder. And so actually it doesn't impact performance when you're gaming very much. Same with AMD's versions of this. It's okay to do some game recording. It won't kill your system by just having it turned on. Now in the unlikely scenario for most people that you are actually GPU bound, there are a few options. Now Star Citizen doesn't have DLSS inbuilt or anything like that, but you can hack in FSR and upscaling stuff. So. I've used programs in the past like Magpie, lots of scalings on Steam. These programs basically inject these technologies into Star Citizen and allow the game to render at a lower resolution, but then be upscaled. And so the GPU basically isn't having to work anywhere near as hard. Now in the image comparison stuff I did, it doesn't look bad. It's not as good as native. Um, so say you wanted to upscale to 4K, 4K native will look better than the upscaling, but it is worth doing if you're trying to eke out a bit more performance of the GPU. And then let's just talk about overclocking for a little bit of time. Overclocking over the last well, maybe decade has become increasingly less important as these CPUs are being pushed pretty close to the max when you get them out of the box. But there is performance to be had by doing a bit of overclocking. I did a bit of testing on a 5900X a while back and found that You've got things like Curve Optimizer, you've got the Ryzen Clock Tuner Utility, you've got PBO, all these sorts of technologies, and there is performance to be had by using them. Same on the Intel side, obviously the K series CPUs can be overclocked. And if you're prepared to go really quite deep with this, you can get significant gains. So in a lot of cases, overclocking is worth looking at. On the GPU, maybe not so much, especially because Star Citizen isn't often GPU bound but you can obviously overclock the GPU as well. So there you go, a whistle stop tour. Now, if you want more information about those topics, the videos that I originally made are below and you can go and watch those and get more information about how to do the tweaks. But remember, you're limited by your CPU most of the time. And so some of these tweaks will help a little bit, but they're not gonna turn something like a 2600 from the Ryzen 2600 into a 5800X3D. There's just no way to do that if you want better performance, the often the answer is to get a better CPU.